Testing, okay, good. All right, uh, today we're gonna talk about LP duality. Uh, LP duality is, uh, well, first we're gonna execute the simplex algorithm and then trying to, we gave a geometric interpretation of the simplex algorithm to solve a linear program. We're gonna actually, we're gonna actually execute the simplex algorithm on an, on an LP, uh, not geometrically, but as we ex perform the execution, we're gonna try to understand where the, uh, where the geometry intuition comes from. So the topic of today is called uh, LP duality. So you're given an LP, and LP is in standard form where you're, you're given um, A, which is a M by N, you're given B, which is a um, m by one, and you're given C, which is a uh, n by one, and you're asked to find some x, uh, which is an n uh, by one, uh, such that you want to maximize C T x subject to uh, a x is less than or equal to b, right? Now this is the standard form of a linear program, but it's not guaranteed to be the form of a linear program that you uh, will be given in. You'll take, you'll take a problem, farmer selling crops, uh, uh, allocating resource in some way, uh, as a set of linear constraints, and then in order to apply a simplex algorithm, you'll have to convert it into uh, what's called standard form, and then once it's in standard form, you can apply uh, the algorithms. Here, x greater than zero, x is a vector, we implicitly mean each of its coordinates are greater than or equal to zero. So it's 10 variables, three variables, what n variables, each of them are greater than or equal to zero. Um, so you may be given a set of inequalities, but they may not be in the form of something, you know, a product, uh, excuse me, a linear combination less than or equal to some b, but you can transform things, you can multiply things by negative one, you can add and subtract and move things around. Eventually you'll get, uh, it's something in standard form, it may have more variables, maybe padded, whatever, but as long as it's in standard form, you can apply the generic uh, LP algorithms. L why is it called duality? So this is something we'll have to deal with in the like, last third of today's lecture, but a du LP duality basically means that every linear program has an evil twin with the exact same solution. And we can use this evil twin to prove the optimality of the original solution. But know that every, we'll talk about this later, but it, it's a fantastically beautiful mathematical result and it's, pro, and it's very closely tied to the correctness of the simplex algorithm. But the fact that there are two linear, linear programs with the same solution, and maybe I'll just even say what they are. So this is what's called the primal, primal solution. What's called the dual solution is you're looking to minimize uh, BTY uh, subject to uh, a T Y is greater than or equal to C. So using the same A, B, and C, you take the transpose of A, you are looking for a Y, which is not N by one, but M by one. And it turns out by what we'll call the LP, uh, LP duality, we'll prove that the max of C T X is equal to, well, uh, is equal to the min of C, uh, excuse me, B, T, Y. Now we're not gonna be able to prove they're equal because that's called strong duality and that proof could take like 70 minutes, but we don't need strong duality for the proof. We'll use something called weak duality, which is just that, right? So we'll be able to prove uh, a useful part of it very simply. Um, why is, does this seem familiar? There's like uh, given to the problem, there's a, there's a, given a maximization problem, there's a dual, which is its minimization, a minimization of problem, and I claim that they have the same solution. Maximizing one problem has, uh, as a dual, minimizing another problem. What's the name of this, what this may remind you of? The Max flow min cut theorem. Max flow min cut theorem says the maximizing the flow is equivalent to minimizing, the, the maximum flows in a flow network is equal to the minimal cut. That's actually just a special case of LD, LP duality because we showed you can phrase uh, a linear pro, uh, we can, you can phrase a flow network and its constraints as a linear program. Sums of flows is just linear combination. So the dual of an L, if you take a max flow, convert it to an LP, and then you take the dual LP, turns out you get a minimum cut problem which is slightly more interesting because it's not obvious how you would simulate the cut, the constraints of the cut in a linear, com a linear combination. 
but that's for you to figure out on the homework because you will get a dual LP and you will s kind of see that, wow, this is actually the dual of the graph, right? We're actually like trying to find a solution to this. The dual LP is actually the minimum cut. Um, right. Uh, so let's just go ahead and uh, talk, talk about how the simplex algorithm executes. Uh, basically, we talked about last time about how it may uh, traverse the, ex the external points of a polytope. So consider the following uh, temporary uh, one. We have max, let's say, x, uh, we'll say 2x1 plus 3x2 plus 5x3. Now here, uh, we write it as a linear combination, but implicitly, of course, it's a set of vectors in uh, an array. Here, this basically means c is 2 comma 3 comma 5, right? Uh, and we're subject to, let's say, uh, x1 plus x2, 2x2 plus x3 is less than equal to, let's say, 4. And then x1, x2, uh, x3 is greater than or equal to 0. This x1, x2, x3 constraint greater than or equal to 0 is usually, uh, sometimes it's not even written, but you may assume it's there. Um, if it's not there, if you have a constraint somehow it's unbounded in two directions, you can represent that as a system of constraints, a system of variables that uh, are all greater than zero. So now if we were to plot uh, this, we have one, really one equation. These, this is the three-dimensional plane. There's three quadrants, excuse me, there's eight quadrants, three quadrants. X1, X2, and X3 is these axes, xi. The constraint x1, x2, x3 greater than or equal to zero partitions three-dimensional space into eight quadrants, and we get to ignore seven of those quadrants, thank God. So we're just gonna look at the first quadrant, which is, uh, suppose it's popping out of the screen. There's gonna be some difficulty in this because, uh, you know, we're representing a three-dimensional object, soon an n-dimensional object uh, as a system of equations, but it's on a two-dimensional board. So if I were to, a, a quick trick you can do if you wanna like think about this visually is you just set, uh, x1, x2 to 0, x2, x3 to 0, and x1, x3 to 0, and you'll get a solution of, upon each axi, and then you plot that point, and then you take the intersection of all three, because you know the plane must be linear. So we know that the intersection of this plane is gonna be here, here, and let's say here, where this is four comma zero comma zero. This is uh, zero comma zero comma four. And this is two comma zero comma, zero comma two comma zero, and then this is of course zero comma zero comma zero, right? Those are the four points, and we form this pyramid. This corner, we sort of put a cobweb in the corner of our of our octant. Excuse me, not a quadrant, an octant. Um, quick, what's the solution to this LP for maximization? There is a solution, certainly. Zero, zero, four. Um, so you can implement the silk simplex algorithm. Sometimes you can do it simpler. We, know, we mentioned last time that the solution must exist at a boundary point. So although there's infinitely many solutions within this weird triangle, there's actually only four points to check. So what you do is plug in zero, zero, zero. Well, that objective function is zero, so that's not it. Zero, two, zero, four, zero, zero, and zero, zero, four. If you notice, the largest coefficient here is five. So if you want to maximize the objective function, maybe look at x3 first before looking at the, any of the others. Now, you can't, the, the constraints say how much you can maximize x1, x2, and x3, but as we see, you can't have x2 be greater than two. The other ones you can be, have, you can, as a trade-off, x1 and 3 have be at most, at most four. So heuristically, sometimes looking at the LP, you can solve it quicker than running the simplex algorithm. And that's, as we'll see in the analysis of the simplex algorithm, it turns out, like, although the, the, the simplex algorithm worst case is, uh, exponential time, super exponential time, something huge. Average case, it's pretty good. It's like, it works really well in practice. Um, why that is, is a little mysterious and people have developed entire theories of analysis and algorithms to try and figure out just why the simplex algorithms worked. I don't remember if it was the Godel Prize or some other prize, but a few years ago, these guys won an award for something called smooth analysis because they invented this new kind of analysis just to study the simplex algorithm, like the way how is it average case looking polynomial, but worst case is still exponential, yes? What is Lagrange optimization? I'm a discrete mathematician. Uh, 
Um, so the less than equal to four function is going to be this boundary. It's going to be, there's four planes, okay? The, this constraint is going to be this triangle plane, the one that's the cornered one, okay? The other three planes implicitly are given by these four constraints. So if you're only optimizing against this plane, what you're actually saying is you're ignoring zero, zero, zero as a point. And according to our, obje our objective function, all the coefficients are positive. So great, actually, it's not going to be that one. But if some of the coefficients are allowed to be negative, it may, be, it may be not be a point in this first place. So there are many other methods, I'll say, to solve an LP that you take the geometric distribution and you try and think about it. One of them is called the interior point method, which instead of t traversing the outskirts of the polytope. So recall, simplex, you like take a walk on the outside of the polytope and then you find your answer uh, by convexity. There's something called the interior point method, which was like, people were so surprised that it works, but instead of going the outside, you cut through the middle and you go through the inside. Now, formulating as an algorithm, much more difficult, but uh, that has slightly better runtime in certain situations. It's called the interior point method. Uh, again, there's, I, you could get a PhD in this stuff. I mean, there's a whole theory of ISYE. They just study this one problem over and over. They haven't done anything else. Um, right, so let's talk about what this, we mentioned simplex as you traverse the outside of the polytope, right? You're taking a walk along the polytope, but again, the algorithm is not given a nice graphic. It doesn't go in Blender and just see that I have these points and I'm gonna take the walk along the outside of the, the convex polygon, the, excuse me, the polytope. But graphically, I mean, uh, using linear algebra, that's what it's representing it. So let's take the geometric intuition and try and go backwards. So suppose we're at a two corners, something like this, okay? And let's say this is planes like uh, A, B, C, D, something like this. I believe it might be a little easier. Okay. So these are um, these are four planes that intersect in two points. Uh, points uh, B, C, D intersect at this point and points A, B, C intersect at this point, right? The intersection of two planes, and again, think n-dimensionally, you can't picture that, but we're gonna just think with, this, we know three dimensions, we're gonna stick with that. If you take two planes and you intersect them, they must intersect in a line. So the line here is the intersection of B and C. A, B, and C are defined with three variables. A, B, C, and D are all defined with three variables constraints. That's what the plane is. And where B equals C, if you set these two inequalities equal to each other, is you'll get the function of this line here, right? Now, if you take three, if you take two planes, intersect them, you get the line. You take three planes, you intersect them. That's an equivalent to choosing a point on the line. So that is just a point. So A, B, and C intersect at a single point. Three planes intersect at a point, or uh, B, C, D here. Now, suppose you're performing a walk. So think geometrically here. We're going to go from B, C, D to the point at the intersection of B, C, D to the point at the intersection of A, B, C. Now, geometrically, this is what happens. But what happens in when we're going to do the linear algebra, what happens is that if you're at this point B, C, D, that means that you are on the plane of B, on the plane of C, and on the plane of D. If you're on the plane, those inequalities are not inequalities, but are equalities, right? An inequality is a partition of three space. So you're like, if you satisfy the inequality, you're either on the plane or below it. But being on the plane corresponds to being equal to it, right? So if you're at BCD, you're equal to these three constraints. So you're at, you say, uh, BCD are uh, not inequalities, but equalities. Now, if you go, when you take the walk, you take the step from this point, from the first point to the second point, you are relaxing D, but making A tight. So D is relaxed, A made tight. So then you go from the set of, uh, you maintain a set of uh, equalities that are tight, inequalities that are tight, as in they're just equalities. You'll go from the set BCD to the set ABC. So you will relax one constraint and require another constraint to be tight. That's what we mean from transition to one point to the other. The reason you're taking the walk from a point along a line to a point is the fact that B and C are still tight. And the fact that B or C is still tight means that as you walk from here to here, excuse me, as you walk from here to here, you're still on this line that intersects BC. Yes. Right. If you're at this point, 
you have satisfied all three planes. You're on all three planes simultaneously. You agree? Now, if you're moving from this point this, to this point, you are on the planes BC, but you're not on the plane D. So the equation corresponding to D is going to go from an equality to an inequality. You'll still satisfy it as a constraint, but it won't be tight. Now, you will, as you move to here, you'll, main, you'll make sure that A is tight. So you relax one constraint to make another constraint tight. One inequality becomes, one equality gets relaxed, another one becomes tight, right? So there's a working set of ones that are tight that you uh, swap in and out, and that's, that's how you traverse, right? Back here in this picture, when you go from 0, 0, 0 to say 0, 0, 4, you find the optimal immediately. This corresponds to these three equations being tight, right? 0, 0, 0, because you're at the intersection of those three planes. Then when you go here, what you're really doing is relaxing the plane of x3 equals 0, because you're allowing x3 to not be 0. You're allowing x3 to grow from 0, right? So you relax x3 greater than 0 to make this one tight, which is x3 equals 4. So you remove the x3 greater than 0 constraint and add this constraint, and that's why it's a valid solution. Any questions on the high-level geometry before we get to the uh, linear algebra? Yes. No. Now, that would still technically solve the problem because one of the beautiful parts about the simplex algorithm is though, although just given a set of constraints with infinitely many solutions, you only have to take finitely many boundary points. So that would technically work. It wouldn't be maybe the best runtime. But simplex algorithm also doesn't have the best runtime. It has an exponential runtime. But average case, simplex is better. Simplex, you can think about instead of trying every possible point, I'm taking a walk to maximize the objective function. And let's say if your objective function points you straight up, orthogonal to the, to the plane, you're trying to maximize that way, you don't need to check points below you. You just only check points above you. It's taking a walk along the polygon. All right. Now, this part has some uh, math. So, and by math, I mean the, the arithmetic, as in I'm going to be doing lots of fractions. Um, I need you guys to make sure that I don't make any mistakes during this part. And also, um, it's not the most important that you know how to do the simplex algorithm on pen and paper. That's the computer's job. A TA asked me, you know, like, why do I need to learn all this machine learning theory if the computer's going to do that for me and I just can use PyTorch? And it's the same question as, like, an elementary schooler asks when they say, um, why do I need to learn how to add and multiply if the calculator does it for me? You know, there's an app for that. And it's not because that specific kid is going to need to know how to add and multiply and he can just use a calculator. So the smart kids might need to know how to add and multiply. But, um, the fact that someone had to write the calculator, you know? So you, if you use the calculator, you're, you won't be able to write calculator 2, whatever that is when it comes out. So you need to know how the simplex algorithms works. It's not so important that you know how to do it on pen and paper. That's the computer's job. But uh, we're still going to do it on the board, right? So we're going to consider the following uh, a, a, a problem. We're going to max uh, 3x1 plus uh, x2 plus 2x3, uh, subject to the following constraints. x1 plus uh, x2 plus x3, 3x3, is less than or equal to 30. Uh, 2x1 plus 2x2 plus 5x3 is less than or equal to 24. Uh, 4x1 plus x2 plus 2x3 is less than or equal to 36. And we'll say that x1, x2, uh, x3 are greater than or equal to 0. Let me see if I can use a different marker. Okay, you're going to uh, project from three-dimensional space into six-dimensional space by adding uh, three slack variables. So you'll convert the linear program to something called slack form. So it's going to look like this. Um, 
z is going to be equal to uh, 3x1 plus uh, x2 plus uh, 2x3. And then we'll say uh, s4 is the slack variable. It's going to equal 30 is equal to 30 um, minus x1 minus x2 minus 3x3. Uh, S5 and S6 are going to be the slack variables for the, the, the second and third equations respectively. This is going to be 24 minus uh, 2x2 minus, excuse me, minus 2x1 minus 2x2 minus 5x3. And then S6 is going to be uh, 4x, uh, excuse me, 36 minus 4x1 minus x2 minus 2x3, okay? This is what we put the LP into what's called slack form. We have now six uh, variables, but we've transitioned from a set of inequalities to a set of equalities. Question? Oh, okay. Um, S4, S5, and S6 correspond to the slack of that spe specific constraint. You take this constraint, you add S4 here. Implicitly, there's a plus S4 here. Then you rewrite that equation in terms of S4. Now, notice that if AX plus B, excuse me, AX is supposed to be, if AX is supposed to be less than or equal to B, then AX plus S is equal to B. AX plus S, S is this difference between the solution and, and, the, and B. Right, so S four, five, six represent this, what's called the slack. Right, if you recall, proof of the uh, we proved subset sum, we added sub slack variables. Right, you change the equality to an inequality. But uh, from here, you can also get the fact that uh, S is then equal to uh, B minus A X. Right. So in some sense, if you wish to maximize X, uh, it's actually similar to just minimizing S, where S is the slack. If you think one dimensionally. It's a little more complicated than that. But if you could find a smallest s that corresponds to some solution x, then that's actually a maximal x, right? There's some hints towards the duality, right? Minimizing the slacks can be thought of as maximizing uh, x. Now, here's the way the simplex algorithm works. Uh, you are going to pivot. Let me write down the details of what the pivot means. Pivot means geometrically a pivot is you move from one point to another point. That's a pivot operation, if you think geometrically. A pivot is you have your set of constraints. One is exiting and one is entering, right? So this, these are called your basic variables. On the left-hand side, these are basic. On the right-hand side, these are called non-basic. Okay? So what you want to do is you want to swap uh, uh, non-basic is going to exit, uh, uh, excuse me, non-basic is going to leave, or it's, which way does it go? It enters. The non-basic variable enters, and a basic variable leaves, okay? And you're gonna repeatedly swap basic and non-basic variables until you transition, until you can't maximize Z anymore. And uh, you wanna choose a non-basic to enter to maximize the objective function, and you're going to choose a basic variable to leave that maximizes the uh, max you can set the entering non-basic variable, right? So just looking at this, we want to choose um, one of the variables, x1, x2, x3, to enter, and we want to choose one of s4, s5, s6 to leave. You can think of the basic variables as those that are tight. So S4, S5, and S6 currently are tight. We're going to swap some stuff around. Um, if you look at the objective function, the entering one, largest coefficient in Z. So you go to Z, you're like, okay, if, I'm, if I have to choose one of X1, X2, X3 to maximize, which one am I going to choose to maximize? So you're going to choose the one with the largest coefficient. So it's going to be X1 is entering. Now, when you choose uh, a, a basic variable to leave, you want to choose the one that maximizes 
uh, x1. So if you consider uh, these three constraints, they actually all give a bound on the maximum value that x1 can take on. If you recall from the picture here, several of the constraints limit uh, x3, right? One of the constraints just says x3 has to be greater than zero, but then the second, the first constraint says x3 can't be more than four, right? So similarly, we're going to bump around x1 and see where it hits a plane. Um, what is the maximum value of x1 if uh, in this first constraint, for this first constraint to be satisfied? 30. The highest one that x1 can be is 30 if s4, are all great, s4, s5, etc. are all greater than or equal to zero, right? The largest value of x1 is going to be from zero to 30. So we know that we have uh, s4, we'll call these equations a, b, and c. We know that a says x1 is less than or equal to 30, okay? B says what? What is the maximum value that B says? What is the largest value S, the, 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 the equation B says that X1 can take on? Yeah, 24. And what is the largest value according to C? Follow the pattern. What is the largest value that X1 can take on? Which one? Correct. Thank you. Okay, what's a according to equation three, and I will make more mistakes like that. You have to get, hopefully you guys are awake. Uh, what is the largest value x one can take on, uh, according to S, uh, S equation C? Yeah, yes. Why? You basically are going to compute a ratio of this uh, non coefficient to four, right? If you set these equal to each other, the largest value that x one could take on is going to be nine, because nine times uh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Thank God. Okay. Um, so you have a set of constraints that say x1 can't be greater than 30, x, x1 can't be greater than 30, x1 can't be greater than 12, and we know that x1 can't be greater than 9. Which one of those is the best one? Which one of those is true? 9. If you, something says x1 can't be greater than 30, and something says x1 can't be greater than 9, then for both of those to be true, x1 can't be greater than 9. It's not true that x1 could be 27, because that violates the third one, right? So you take the least upper bound. If when you take the least upper bound, you're going to take the equation, uh, that the basic variable that corresponds to the, the, that equation. So you know that um, S6 is leaving. So you're going to swap S, X1 and S6. Now S, why am I using S instead of X? Just to make sure you remember that it's slack. But really these are four variables. S1, excuse me, X1, X2, X3, S4, S5, S6. I could have equally said X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, S, X6, right? Um, how do you write, how do you rewrite the entire system of equations so that S6 is going to be on the right-hand side, and you want X1 to be on the left-hand side. How would, you, how would you do that if you're like a middle schooler? What? Solve for X1. The answer I'm looking for is Gaussian elimination. You just rewrite the equations, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's what you're going to do. So how would that look like? You're going to uh, hopefully double-check this for me, but I have... I'm going to rewrite um, equation 6 in terms of x1 to get uh, x1 is equal to 9 minus 1 fourth uh, x2 minus 1 half, um, yeah. Minus 1 half x3 
uh, minus one quarter uh, S6, okay? We took this equation and we wrote it in terms of X1, right? Now, we're going to plug that back in to all, wherever X1 appears, here and here, to rewrite those equations, move stuff around, uh, and we're going to get uh, the following uh, slack form. We're going to get Z is equal to 27 plus 1 fourth uh, X2 plus 1 half uh, X3 plus minus 3 fourths uh, S6. And we're going to get uh, as our basic variables X1, S4, S5. And X1 is going to be equal to the exact constraint that we have up there, which is 9 minus 1 fourth X2 uh, minus 1 half X3 minus 1 fourth S6. S4, uh, we're going to plug uh, this one into, into uh, S, uh, that one. We're going to get 21 minus uh, th th 3 fourths X2 minus 5 halves uh, X3 plus 1 fourth uh, S4, excuse me, S6. Um, and then S5 is going to be equal to 6 minus 3 halves X2 minus 4 X3 plus 1 half uh, S6. Okay. Now, uh, do I expect you to be able to check all that work really quickly for me? Maybe not. So maybe we'll make some mistakes along the way because there's, uh, you know, fractions um, and all that. The computer is supposed to be doing this for me. Uh, again, the only numbers I know are 0, 1, and n. Yes? C? Ah, I took Z and then I plugged in this one. I plugged in S1 in terms of two already non-basic variables, but now S6. So we simply took this equation for the basic variable, rewrote it in terms of X1, and then everywhere we saw an X1, we plugged that in. So we'll only get answers in terms of X2, X3, S6. So you see our basic, our non-basic variables, excuse me, are all S2, S3, S6. And conveniently, I've arranged them into the nice columns, right, to correspond to the, the matrix. Any questions so far on, on this pivot operation? Does the math, is the math mathing? Would you believe me that that's the correct answer? Um, notice, though, that we've gone, uh, what do we know about the objective function so far? If, if we performed a single pivot operation, what can we say about the objective function? X1, X2, X, all the variables are supposed to be greater than zero, right? They can't be negative. The least they can be is zero. But there's a 27 here. So what we can say is whatever the objective function is can't be uh, less than 27. Do you agree? Whatever solution we have for uh, Z, X2 and X3 can only increase it. S6 is going to decrease it, but the worst it can decrease it by is zero, if we set that to zero. So we know the objective function can't be greater, uh, excuse me, can't be less than 27, because it's at least 27 so far. In terms of a walk along the polytope, we have swapped S, S4, S5, S6 for being tight for X1, S4, S5 for being tight. This corresponds to the following uh, walk. It's as if we went from 0, 0, 0, 0, 30, 24, uh, 36 to the point uh, 9, 0, 0, 21, 6, 0. Okay? Now, again, this is in six dimension space. Can't picture what that is. But those are points along the six dimensional polytope as the intersection of planes. And we have gone from this point to this point, okay, so far. If you project back down to three space, you know, a three dimensional object is a two dimensional shadow. A six dimensional object, you can consider 
having this three-dimensional shadow, it can have other dimensional shadows as projections, but you can, suppose you only look at the three-dimensional shadow of the original problem, just consider 0, 0, 0 and 9, 0, 0. We've gone from 0, 0, 0 to 9, 0, 0 along that polytope, right? That's the quote-unquote walk by performing this pivot. So it's important you understand the geometric interpretation of the pivot as, as rewriting a system of linear equations, not inequalities now because we added some slack variables and now everything's a system of linear equalities instead of inequalities. Any question on the in intuition behind the pivot? We're gonna do two more pivots. Do we understand the pivot operation, how it, why it's correct at least? Why it, it emulates this walk along the, the path? All right, let's pivot again. Uh, entering is going to be what? What variable is going to be entering? What, which non-basic variable is going to be entering? Again, you want to choose a non-basic variable that maximizes the objective function. So it has to, be, it has to come from the set of non-basic variables. It can only be one of x2, x3, or s6. Which one of those will you choose to maximize the objective function? Which one of S2, X2, X3, or S6 has the greatest coefficient in, uh, if you can't read that, the greatest coefficient in, um, Z? S6, but that's negative. Actually, so you, if you increase it, you would go less than 27. So that's the, actually, that's the, that's the most wrong answer. So, uh, which one? X3. X3. If you increase X3, you recall each one is positive, right? So, if you, S6 would have to be greater than or equal to zero. So, if you increase S6, you would actually decrease your objective function. If you want to maximize Z, you want to increase one of X2 or X3 because those, those are the only ones with positive coefficients. Now, every point you put into X2 will increase your objective function by a quarter. Every point you put into X3 will increase your objective function by half. So, we're going to choose to enter uh, X3. Okay, why one half is greater than one fourth. Now leaving, you wanna consider again the ratios. So let's suppose you chose to maximize X3. Uh, and the, suppose I were to write those bottom four, the bottom three equations, S1, S4, S5, uh, in terms of what they say about X3 uh, as an upper bound. Um, I have the following, A says, uh, X3 is uh, less than or equal to 18. B says uh, X3 is less than or equal to 8.4, whatever that is as a fraction. And then C says the, the least upper bound, which is that X3 is less than or equal to 1.5, right? Let's convince ourselves of that. S3 course, as C so corresponds to the, the, the formula with S5 equals six minus and so on. So you have uh, the coefficient of x3 in that equation is 4, which is quite large, and that the non-coefficient number there, the y equals mx plus b, that's the b, that's 6 there, of that linear plane, uh, that corresponds, that's a pretty small number. So the greatest that x3 could be before it hits the plane, if you were to maximize x3, would be 1.5, because that's 6 over 4, right? So you can't be, you can't be greater than that. Um, right. So we're gonna, so our, ent our leaving variable is going to be S5. Okay. Now I'm going to rewrite everything in terms of that. So just give me, let me go nonverbal for like two minutes. Just give me a second. Um, by the way, uh, before, we, before we get into that, if we know that X3 can't be greater than 1.5, we know what about our, what about our obje objective function? We know that the objective function currently is at least 27. Whatever our, by objective function, I mean the optimal solution is at least 27. It could be more than 27. But by increasing x3, we're gonna increase it to at most 1.5 by choosing that plane. By choosing the least upper bound, we're choosing to, hi to grow x3 till it hits the plane corresponding to the third equation, s5 equals whatever. 
S, if we do that, X3 can't be more than 1.5. So the objective function can't increase by more than a function of X3 equals 1.5. So if you plug in 1.5 in there for X3, you're going to grow the objective function by uh, 1.5 times 1 half, which is 0 0.75, right? So we know that the optimal is going to grow to at least 0.75 more. So we know that the optimal is going to be greater than 27 plus 0 0.75 so far. Do we see, again, linear algebra, system of inequalities, equalities, whatever, but there's always geometry behind the surface. It's just a simulation of that. So this, that's where the geometry comes in. I can see that happening before I even did the pivot. Do you guys believe that? Do you guys see that as well? Yes. Okay, so now let me write down the, the rewriting. Uh, I'm going to have x3 rewritten as is equal to 3 halves minus uh, 3 eighths uh, x2 minus 1 fourth uh, s5 plus 1 eighth uh, s6. And then I'll have z is equal to uh, 1, 1, 1 over 4 plus 1 16th uh, x2 um, minus 1 eighth s5 minus 11, 11 16th s6 uh, and then I'll have x1 x3 uh, x, s, x3 and then s4 as our basic variables and these are course going to correspond to uh, 33 over 4 uh, minus 1 I hope this is right. Can't read my own handwriting. X3 is going to be equal to 3 halves minus 3 eighths. Again, the computer is supposed to be doing this for me. Okay, so we get this system of equalities now uh, in uh, our basic variables are now x3, x4, and s4, and our uh, non-basic variables are gonna be x2, s5, and s6. Now, what is 11, one, what is 111 divided by 4? The calculator has to do it. You don't have to do it in your head. Yep, 27.75, exactly as I predicted. I knew that would count. So our optimal is greater than or equal to 27.75. Uh, now, this corresponds, this pivot corresponds to the following walk. It's going to be um, it's going to be as if we went from 9, 0, 0, 21, 6, 0 in six dimensional space to the point 33 over 4, 0, 3 over 3 halves, uh, 69 over 4, 0, 0. Right. So we went from this point in six space to that point in six space. Again, you project the shadow down in three space. Is we went from 9, 0, 0 to 33 over 4, 0, 3 halves, right? That's the walk in uh, free space. Let's do uh, one more pivot, and we'll be a little fast about this. I won't even write down the um, equations. What is our, uh, given that we have this system of equations, uh, what is our entering variable? So look to z, which variable x2 S5 or S6, can you increase to maximize the objective function? X2, why? This is the only one with a positive coefficient left. Increasing S5 or S6, again, because they're not negative, uh, means that that's the only one that grows the, the thing. So we know that entering is going to be X2. Now, what is our leaving variable? We'll consider the ratios here. Uh, that's fractions. I don't want to do that. I just worked it out for you. It's going to be 
um, upper bounds are going to be uh, x2 is less than or equal to 132, x2 is less than or equal to 4, and then x2 is less than or equal to infinity. Oh, so that doesn't help us. Notice here, this is the only one with a non-negative uh, coefficient here. So increasing x2 uh, will increase uh, s4 always, because these are, this is positive. It's, if you set x2 to a billion, well, s4 is now a billion plus 69 and a half times this coefficient, whatever, right? So the, the really x, this constraint doesn't actually bound you in that direction. Correspondingly, in six-dimensional space, you have an unbounded domain this way, right? This one is an unbounded constraint. So you take the least upper bound, it's going to be this one. So our entering variable is going to be x3. Yes, x3 is our entering variable. Now, if we were to rewrite that, and I'll skip ahead a little bit, we're going to get the following. We're going to get z is equal to 28 minus 1 over 6 uh, x3 minus 1 over 6 s5. minus two-thirds, S6. Uh, X1 is going to be equal to uh, eight plus one-sixth, X3 plus one-sixth, S5, uh, minus one-third, S6, uh, X2, and S4, or our basic variables, those are going to be equal to 4 plus, excuse me, minus 8 thirds uh, x3 minus 2 thirds s5 plus 1 third s6. s4 is then going to be equal to 18 minus 1 half x3 plus 1 half s5. Uh, plus zero times S6, okay? So that's our, I claim that's our final solution, the simplex algorithm terminates. Why have we found the optimal solution? Yeah, each, a pivot swaps is a walk along the path. You choose one point to another point. You can take any walk you want, but we're only taking a walk that maximizes the objective function. But notice that n there are no more walks to, there are no more pivots we can make to maximize the objective function. And if we are out of pivots to make to maximize the objective function, we found the objective. We've, we've found the optimal solution. What is the optimal solution? What is CTX, the C transpose times X now? Twenty eight. Any if any increase in X three, S five, or S six will decrease the objective. So we know that the objective function is maximized when x3, s5, and s6 are zero, and so the objective function is just 28, right? This course, question, yeah? Sorry, what, can you yell? Ah, but implicitly, not me, but the computer would keep track of the point itself, and I claim that we go from the point 33 uh, four, zero, three halves, 69 over four, zero, zero, to the point eight, four, zero, 18, zero, zero, right? Um, if you just look at Z, if you, let's say you didn't do that and you did it in pen and paper, you want to re-get, you want to get the actual solution X back out, not just the objective. X3, S5, S6 set to zero, right? To maximize the objective function, those are zero, done. 
Uh, the other ones, then you can compute from those because then the x1, x2, s4 are simply linear combinations of those, right? Look at that, 8, 4, 18. So that's your solution. Um, now when you project back down, let's, we can reinterpret this again in geometry. S4, S5, S6 are supposed to be the slack variables of the above uh, one in black, right? S4 is supposed to correspond to the first one. S5 is supposed to correspond to the second one. S6 is supposed to correspond to the third one. But uh, if we have S5 and S6 being zero, what do we know about the second and third equations? of our system of linear inequalities. If S4 and S, as, excuse me, as F5, as, if S5 and S6 are the slack of, of the second and third inequalities and the slack is zero, then we know those two equations are tight. So we know the optimal solution is, the, is having the, third, the second and third equations equaling 24 and equaling 36. So those two are tight. We're on the boundary of those two equations. Now the third one is not, uh, excuse me, the first one is not tight. Our slack is 18. So the solution is 18 away from that plane. So 30 minus 18 is uh, 12. No, 22, 12. 12, it's 12. 30 minus 18 is 30 minus 18 is 12. So you're 12 away from that plane. So that one is not tight, right? You can reinterpret again the slack as the solution. 840 is the point the actual point along the polytope that we're at, right? Um, great, so we did the simplex algorithm, and now again, the computer's gonna do this for you, which is important to understand ge geometrically how you can do this with linear algebra. Let's prove the uh, duality theorem. I'm gonna keep uh, at least the original uh, linear program and the final solution to our linear, our, 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 our slack form uh, last solution uh, on the board. But this other intermediary work, the computer just forgets. The intermediary work does correspond to the literal path that the algorithm takes along the uh, polytope, right? Let's uh, talk about duality again. So we claim that the simplex algorithm outputs some number, okay? And we kind of like said, well, if all these geometric analogies are true, then this is op the optimal solution. We can't maximize the objective function. But we still haven't proved that the simplex algorithm is optimal. We haven't proved that the output of the algorithm is equal to the optimal solution. And that's what we need to do today. And we're going to use that using duality. So um, if we have a, a primal linear, uh, primal LP is the original. Uh, it's, you're maximizing CTX subject to uh, a x less than equal to b and x is greater than zero and here x greater than zero a vector being greater than zero means all of its coordinates are greater than zero uh, the dual lp the evil twin the yin to the yang is minimization of bty you're finding the smallest y in the in the dual but you're finding this maximal x in the primal such that uh, you're subject to uh, a t y is greater than or equal to c Linear algebra is full of these geometric transforms, and I think this is such a beautiful uh, thing that there's like a, an evil twin. There's probably some geometric analogy about why this works. The same reason when you take the determinant of a matrix, it corresponds something to about volume of like a parallel polaboloid or something, and parallel pipette. Yeah, and then when you take the, uh, the transpose of a matrix, you get a different parallel pipette with the same volume, right? Um, so you, keep, you can just keep moving stuff around and maintain certain properties. Now this is the primal and the dual. If you take the dual of the dual, what is the dual of the dual? The primal, yeah, the dual of the dual, the evil twins twin, the evil twins evil twins according to the evil twin is the primal, right? And again, that's simply by the fact that the transpose of the transpose is the original. So all these things uh, work back out, right? The transpose of a matrix, again, you flip it along the diagonal. Um, uh, so duality, the duality theorem says the strong duality theorem, we won't prove the strong duality theorem, but we'll prove weak duality. It says the max of CTX is equal to the min of CTY, excuse me, BTY. Um, but what do we know, what can we think should happen if this is to be true, what do we think should happen if 
we have a LP with an unfeasible solution. So let's suppose we take a primal LP and it has no solution. If it has no solution, there's two cases, right? Again, it could be, suppose primal is one of two things. It is unbounded, so there is no, con you're not defining a finite polytope. It's somehow just like max x1 subject to x1 greater than zero. Well, there's just x1 is infinity, right? There's no solution, quote unquote. You just max, max x1. Uh, and the other, um, the feasible region is not, uh, doesn't exist because it's contradictory. Two of the equations are contradictory. So if we know that the solution of, the duality theorem says that the solution of the solution, uh, the, the solution of the primal equals the solution of the dual, and we'll call that other one, uh, is unfeasible. What do we know about the solution to the dual? It's also doesn't have a solution. Here's the proof. Assume to the contrary that you were in, the primal was infeasible or unbounded and the dual had a solution. The dual of the dual then should have a solution, but the dual of the dual is the original, which was unfeasible contradiction, right? So in fact, you get even something more interesting than, than, than this. If the dual, if the primal is unbounded, then the dual is infeasible. And if the primal is inf unfeasible, uh, unfeasible, infeasible, unfeasible, Un if the primal is unfeasible, then the dual is unbounded. It's infeasible. Oh, there's a Bart Simpson joke about this where he says, uh, me fail English, impossible. Um, the primal, if the primal is infeasible, then the dual is unbounded. Okay. So the, la the lack of non-solution actually of the dual transforms to the other lack of non-solution, right? Let's prove uh, the weak duality theorem. It's actually one sentence. Uh, when we proved max flow min cut, we were able to say that the maximum flow had to be less than every cut. We were, it was a roundabout way where we were able to talk about equality. It took us some time to get the equality of those two things to be, to be true. But we knew that the max flow was less than or equal to the min cut because every flow was less than or equal to any cut because the cut is a boundary condition on the flow. So this is basically an analogous to the same thing. Um, we're going to prove the weak duality theorem and that's going to be sufficient for us to prove the correctness of the simplex algorithm. So recall the definitions of the primal and the dual and we want to compute uh, the weak duality. which is that uh, the max of CTX is less than or equal to the min of BTY. What we're going to do is just show under sufficient conditions that are there that any solution X that satisfies it and any value CTX is going to be less than or equal to BTY, where X and Y satisfy uh, their constraints. AX is less than or equal to B and that ATY is greater than or equal to C. For any equation that's true, we know that CTX is going to be less than or equal to Y. That's sufficient to prove that the max CTX is going to be less than or equal to the min, CTY, min BTY. Here's the proof. Uh, CTX is a dot product of two vectors, okay? X, C is a, coef is, a, is a vector. It's got some coefficients in it. X, a vector of variables. You do X1, C, C1, X1, C2, X2, and so on, right? But if there's a dot product of vectors, you can just dot product the opposite. So I have... This is equal to xt, c. You get the same answer when you do it that way. Would you agree? Um, same thing, it's just a dot product. Well, what do we know about c? Well, we know that ATY is greater than or equal to c. So we know that xtc must be less than or equal to xt, and we replace c for ATY. You guys remember linear algebra? Have you guys learned the shoes and socks properties? Do you guys know the shoes and socks properties of the, of the definition of a transpose, or in fact, a general algebraic permutation stuff? Uh, the shoes and socks properties, very briefly, uh, states that uh, AB transpose is equal to B transpose A transpose. For two, if it's three or more, it gets more complicated, but for two, at least, that's true. Why is that true? 
Uh, why is it called the shoes and socks property? You, it, true, you'd have to prove it, but we'll just take it as a theorem today. It's called shoes and socks property because you can't take your socks off before you take your shoes off. So to take your shoes, put on your shoes, put on your socks, take off your shoes, take off your socks. You gotta go in that order, right? So what do we know about X T A T? That's gonna be AX transpose. We agree? You have, have you guys heard the shoes and socks property? Have you heard it called the shoes and socks property? You've never heard it called that? Well, that's how I remember. Uh, have you, you've seen it though. Okay, good. I don't know what, what level of linear algebra is it supposed to be seen at. So I think everyone should have taken linear algebra right now, right? Um, ATX, uh, ATY. What do we know about uh, AX though? A a AX is less than or equal to B. If, a if X is an optimal solution according to its constraints, then AX is less than or equal to B. QED. Okay. Okay, so done. Do you guys believe me that we proved the strong uh, weak duality theorem? Are you convinced that we proved CTX is less than or equal to BTY? Now, how do we use this to certify optimality of the uh, simplex algorithm? We want to guarantee that the output of the simplex algorithm is optimal. But what we're gonna do is use the weak duality theorem. Recall how we certified optimality of the maximum min cut algorithm. What we did was we just found any, if any flow equaled any cut, then they must have been optimal. If any uh, x, any y, has ctx equal to bty uh, and ax less than equal to b, of course. Uh, A transpose y is greater than equal to c. Then x, y are optimal. So if you can find any solution, you have some solution to the primal, you ran simplex. If you can find any solution to the dual, that is equal to the solution to the primal. In, in our case, the special case, the solution to the primal would have been 28. Now, if we re, if we computed the dual, re-ran simplex, and we got 28, that would be sufficient for us to prove optimality. Because if you have any solution to the dual equaling any solution to the primal, then they must be the same, right? Here's the way you can think about max less than equal to something that's min. You can think of it like this. Uh, if you have a set of numbers, let's say you have like, we, we optimized from what? We went from like 20, to, we went from zero to 20 to 27, to 27.7, five to 28, right? If you have this set of numbers, you are maximizing along that. Now consider whatever the solutions to the dual are, I don't know what they are, but you have like 28, you have 30, maybe 30.1, maybe you have 37, and maybe you have 100, okay, something like this. These are the only solutions to the, to the dual. Um, the maximum solution to the primal has to be equal to the minimum solution of the dual, right? So if you find any solution to the primal that equals any solution to the dual, then they have to be the optimal. That's how we're gonna quote unquote certify optimality. Now we're just neat, so all we need to do is to prove that 28 was the optimal solution, not just for this linear program, for maybe for any linear program, you just need to rerun simplex algorithm on the primal after converting it to standard form. But we don't actually need to do that because uh, one of the beautiful parts about the simplex algorithm is it implicitly computes the solution to the, pro to the dual at the same time of computing the solution to the primal. So we get the same, this, we just given the output of the simplex algorithm, we can actually get a solution to the dual. So here's my, um, a uh, little formula. We have, as our output here, we have, um, we have z is equal to some number minus a summation, right? So in general, we're gonna have, let's say z is equal to like, I don't know, v prime minus a sum of, of, of coefficients times uh, our non-basic variables. You can consider our basic variables with coefficient zero in there as well. So we take z and we get this, whatever this is out. We'll call this dj xj, 
for a j is equal to one to, uh, let's say two n, right? Whatever that is. Basic n, excuse me, uh, all variables, basic, non-basic, slack, normal, whatever, right? Um, then I claim that we can have y in terms of that, where yi uh, is gonna be equal to uh, dj if, um, excuse me, is equal to dn plus i if uh, xn plus i is non-basic. And it's gonna be zero if xn plus i is basic. So in fact, this is our z, these coefficients of one sixth, one sixth, two thirds actually is the y. You were optimizing the coefficients at the same time as optimizing x1, x2, and x3. The coefficients are actually just the y solution, right? That's what it is. So um, let's transform this to prove the optimality. All we need to do is find one solution to the dual that is equal to 28. So what we're gonna do is take that formula, uh, get a solution, plug it into the dual, and hope that it equals 28. And if it equals 28, then we know that the simplex algorithm is optimal, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set uh, y1, y2, and y3. Again, this is going to be one by, excuse me, m by one. Uh, x is n by one, but here x equal, n equals m because our matrix was square. Uh, y1, y2, y3 is supposed to satisfy at y uh, is greater than or equal to c, so y is gonna be the, not x1, x2, x3 is the number of columns, but the number of rows. So it's gonna be three, because we have three equations, one variable of y corresponds to each, 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 equa each equation. So we get uh, y1, well this is gonna correspond to x4, uh, x5, and x6, and I suppose instead of s4, s5, s, s6, I talked about x1, x4, x5, x6, right? Um, X4 does not appear, so it's zero. X5's coefficient, S5's coefficient is one sixth. And S6's coefficient is two thirds. Notice that this corresponds to the slack variables, conveniently, minimizing the, uh, the slack. Um, now if we plug that in to, uh, what is BTY? That's gonna equal to 30 times zero. So we have 30, 24, 36. So that's 30 times zero plus 24 times uh, one sixth plus 36 times two thirds. That's gonna be equal to zero plus, what's a sixth of 24 is gonna be four and what's two thirds of 36? That's going to be 24. 24 plus four is 28. Oh, look at that. Now you should also double check by plugging y into a transpose and then confirming that it's greater than or equal to c. Uh, but the computer can do that for me. Um, great, look at that, 28. The solution to the dual is equal to the solution for the primal. So we know the simplex algorithm is optimal, QED. Any questions on how we applied weak duality to prove the, simpl uh, the simplex algorithm outputted the correct answer? Okay, there's one more uh, small thing we can do. And sometimes, given a linear program, just a quick little trick, you can certify optimality quicker. Oh, uh, what is the runtime of simplex, by the way? Kind of a difficult question. Uh, you can kind of upper bound it as the number of times you have to swap variables, so it's gonna be n plus n, choose n which is in the worst case exponential. However, uh, on an average case, it's closer to O of uh, n, n plus n. It appears to be O of n plus n on an average case. Again, I said that people have developed very complicated theories to explain why this works so well on average, but not so good in the worst case. Um, let's do one quick example of certifying optimality. Suppose you're trying to get the following linear program. X1 plus six X2, subject to X1 is less than or equal to 100. Uh, x2 is less than or equal to 300, and then that x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 400. 
Now, if you were to run simplex on this, the optimal, optimal is uh, 1,900, OK? But how do you prove that the, you can't get more than 1,900? Simpler than you can prove than doing duality. All you have to do is take a linear combination of the uh, equations and hope that you get uh, the statement 1900, right? So this is A, B, C. What do we think uh, 5B plus C is equal to, right? 5B plus C is going to be equal to X1 plus X2 plus 5X2, right? is less than equal to uh, 300 times 5 plus 400, right? Did I do that right? What is uh, this? This is going to be x1 plus 6x2, less than equal to 1900, right? Just by Gaussian elimination, we were able to get that. Well, it's not elimination, it's unelimination, I guess. x1 plus 6x2 is just the objective function. So we actually got an upper bound on the objective function of 1900. So if we found a solution of 1900, and we know just by the constraints, the linear combination of the constraints, they tell us we can't get rid of the 1900, well, we know the, that our solution is optimal there as well. It's the same thing as LP duality, but it's, uh, sometimes you can do it simpler. Right? So this is a certification of the solution. All right, uh, that's all I have for you. See you guys Thursday. <laughs>